I'd like, I'd like everybody in the audience uh, to please stand. Now, if you are a female between the ages of 25 and 35, uh, I'd like you to remain standing. Everybody else can be seated. Now, those of you who are standing, this talk is for you. Everybody else, I don't really care about. <laughs> of course, that you know, isn't true. You're my audience. I care about each and every one of you. But if you found that exercise appalling, the way I labeled you, I hope you'll pay attention to my talk, because uh, you might learn something. In the world of Harry Potter, there's a curse known as the Imperious Curse. And when a victim is underneath this curse, the caster can force the victim to do anything he pleases. And the victim is oblivious to this manipulation. Today, many of us are under a similar type curse, and we don't even recognize it. Let me give you an example. Over a third of relationships today begin online, and of course, that has been exacerbated in a time of social distancing. Many relationship begins on dating apps that use something called collaborative filtering. The collaborative being between you, the app's algorithm, and the popularity of the other users. The more popular the users are with others, the more likely you are to see them. These are the type of apps where you swipe left or swipe right. So when you first open this app for the first time, it has very little data or information about you. So it's gonna show you the most popular users first. And as you begin swiping left, and swiping right, it begins to build a profile on you. It begins to understand your preferences. Maybe it begins to see that you have a preference for that type of person. <laughs> because, come on, who doesn't have a preference for that type of person, right? All kidding aside, you might miss an opportunity to meet someone who could change your life in profound and dramatic ways. You could miss an opportunity to meet someone who, who could be outside of your expectations of what is beautiful and the type of person you should fall in love with. You could miss an opportunity to meet your soulmate because an algorithm has decided you wouldn't be interested in that type of person. Manipulation is giving a control or choice to someone else or something else. Today, many of us are giving away our control and choice to an algorithm. So you might be saying, what is this algorithm and why does it have so much control over me? Well, algorithms are the engines that drive machine intelligence and they are everywhere. The content that appears at the first page of a search engine or at the top of your TikTok for you page, those are algorithms. You know when it's 645 and you're heading to the gym and you look at your phone and your phone knows that you're heading to the gym and it knows right where your gym is at? You might find that creepy or marvelous. But either way, that's an algorithm. The content that appears on Amazon or Netflix or Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, those are all pretty much dictated uh, by algorithms. Some of you are here today because you know me and love me and want to support me. Hi, mom and dad. But still others are here because an algorithm thought this was an event they'd be interested in and pointed them to that event. And still others are watching a video online because an algorithm showed them that video. Imagine you're playing a game of basketball. Now you expect the referee to call the game fairly for both sides, to enforce the rules fairly. But what if you found out the ref was actively working to help your opponent win? How would that make you feel? Algorithms are the foundation of machine learning. When a machine learns, whether the machine be whether software, applications, robots, when it learns, it does so through data. It is fed enormous amounts of data. And yet, we the humans have to set the rules that help guide the algorithms. So if we want the algorithm to learn the difference between a dog and a cat, we first have to label the dog and the cat. But what if we inverted those labels? The algorithm wouldn't see the mistake. It would just blindly follow the rules we've established for it. This is called dirty data, which is incorrect or uh, inaccurate or uh, inequitable data. So let me give you some examples of how dirty data creeps into algorithms and causes bias. Well, let's say you want an algorithm to uh, identify a cat. So you tell the algorithm a cat always has hair. Well, the algorithm might be able to identify this type of cat, but it may not identify that type of cat. 
Now, if uh, you want an algorithm to identify a doctor, but the algorithm, the historical data the algorithm is fed says that doctors are primarily men. The algorithm may understand that a doctor can be a man, but it may fail to understand that a doctor can also be a woman. Now, if you feed an algorithm a, da a data set filled with pictures of people who look like me, white men, but you f it lacks pictures of people with maybe darker skin, the algorithm may be able to easily identify people who look like me, but it may struggle to identify people with darker skin. I get asked, how, is an how can an algorithm be biased? It's just computer code, right? Code can't be biased. Well, a baby isn't born biased, but it can become biased through its experience, its what it learns, through what it's taught. Similarly, an algorithm isn't born biased, but it can become biased. Let me give you a couple of ways. The first is algorithmic error. That is when an algorithm is fed dirty data and then it makes bad decisions. But also, an algorithm can inherit existing human biases and then build on those biases. Google is the undisputed master of search, and there's a reason why. It does an incredible job of giving us what we want very quickly. But even bias can creep into the Google search engine. And some really great research has been done in the areas of bias in internet search, but I want to highlight one, and that's Sophia Amuja Noble. And her work, uh, she wrote Algorithms of Oppression, and her book helped highlight how algorithms in internet search could be prejudice against black women. So I was inspired by a Wired article I read to do a similar search to the, article, or to the, uh, to the search that Wired had done. So I did this search on my own of Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is one of the most successful actors in Hollywood, star of maybe the most successful franchise in Hollywood history, The Avengers. So I get what I think I should get when I search Robert Downey Jr. A lot of stuff about his work, his movies, his co-stars. But if I do a similar type search of an equally caliber actress uh, who is also a star of The Avengers, Scarlett Johansson, I get this, very little about her work but I do get a lot about her appearance, her looks, her beauty, her makeup, her dress. This is reinforcing harmful stereotypes that say men are valuable for their work and women are valuable for their attractiveness. Those are stereotypes that have no longer have a place in our society. Now, if I do a search of professional hairstyles, well, I get a lot of pictures of blonde hair. But if I do a search of unprofessional hairstyles, I get words like black, black hair, natural hair, and weave. Now, if I do a search of school girls, or school boys, excuse me, I get this. But if I do a search of school girls, I get this. Google has a profound impact today on the way we see the world. And Google necessarily wasn't born biased. The internet search in general wasn't born biased, but it can become biased when it inherits existing human biases. Algorithms are playing a part in nearly every stage of our lives today. From our earliest education, uh, algorithms are being used, automated essay scoring systems are being used to grade student essays, often with little or no human oversight. A study of one of these assessment tools showed that certain demographics, it was inflating the grades of certain demographic students while deflating the grades of other demographic students compared to how human graders would have graded those essays. Who gets to set the rules anyway on what makes a good essay, right? Who gets to make those rules? And are those rules as fair to those who speak English as a second language as they are to those who speak English as a first language? Algorithms are being used to help colleges whittle down the enormous amount of applications they get every year to decide who gets into their universities. But can an algorithm necessarily understand when a high school has been inflating grades in order to meet a certain criteria? Can it understand when a student has been uh, embellishing or flat out lying about accomplishments? Can it understand when a student uh, has had to work or get up early to cook her brother breakfast because her parents were either working or not in the picture? Can it understand when a student has had to bounce from couch to couch to couch and didn't have a stable home? Can it understand 
when a student has had to work twice as hard as another student to get to the same place. Algorithms are being used in hiring. This is fantastic. It opens up those jobs to a wider pool of candidates. It's way better than the old, that dude was in my resume, or uh, was in my fraternity, hire that dude. Uh, but algorithms can creep into these, or biases can creep into these algorithms as well. A famous example is Amazon, who over a 10 year period, uh, stud, did a, uh, used an assessment tool to analyze resumes. And what it found was the, the tool was inflating the resumes of men and deflating the resumes of women. Why? Because traditionally Amazon had hired men for those positions. So the algorithm learned to prefer a male candidate over a female candidate. Facial scanning algorithms are being used essentially to interview job candidates. They're assessing things like word choice, speaking voice, and facial movements, and then generating an automatic employability score that ranks them against other uh, job candidates. But are, are these tools uh, as fair to all demographics and ethnicities? Are they as fair to those who may have physical differences? Police are using algorithms uh, to help them s figure out where to send resources. But an algorithm can't necessarily understand if an arrest was unfair or unjust. It just sees an arrest. And the algorithm is going to send police where it thinks the crime is. But it doesn't understand that that traditionally is where police have sent resources. Therefore, that's where they've seen the crime. Therefore, that's where they've made arrests. Therefore, that's where they've sent more resources. Therefore, that's where they've made more arrests. It is reinforcing that cycle or that cycle of bias in over police communities and legitimizing that bias. Algorithms today are being used to assess people's attractiveness. How beautiful an algorithm thinks you are uh, may help decide if you're able to appear on somebody else's social media profile or maybe your opportunity to go viral. It used to be that beauty was in the eye of the beholder. Today, beauty is in the stomach of an algorithm, an algorithm that might look at you and say, it's time for you to get plastic surgery. So we've seen that an algorithm can label you unprofessional or unattractive. But what if an algorithm can't recognize you at all? That was the shocking discovery by MIT Media Labs researcher and Algorithmic Justice League founder, Joy Bomwini. She studied several of the most popular facial analysis algorithms, and what she found was that these algorithms were misidentifying women, darker-skinned women many times more than lighter-skinned men. Her work helped bring widespread awareness to the problems of bias in algorithms. Why is this important? Because these facial analysis algorithms are the technology behind facial recognition cameras. And these cameras are going up in schools, at borders, at the airports, in malls, in public places, and in government buildings. And if these cameras misidentify or fail to identify an individual, it opens that person up to greater scrutiny by law enforcement. It opens them up potentially to harassment, detainment, or worse. And we all know all too well that these encounters that may begin innocently too often end in violence. In fact, in 2020, Detroit police arrested an African-American man based solely on his identification by a facial recognition camera. They didn't do any police work. If they had done some police work, they would have understood the man had an alibi for the robbery in question for the time. At the time, he was sitting in his car, singing to the radio and broadcasting that over his private Instagram live feed. But the police didn't do any police work. They just blindly trusted the algorithm. And because of it, a man was arrested in front of his wife and children, detained for 10 hours, and then forced to tell his coworkers and friends the reason why. Well, that's my talk. Thanks for coming. Now, of course, that's not my talk. What do we do about it? How do we solve this thing? Well, they're, they're, we're going to tackle this in many, many different ways, and many people are already working on it. In the last years, there has been a boon of awareness about this problem that has been uh, really, really good to see, uh, especially from somebody who's, who's looked into this. But let me go back to the two areas we talked about earlier. The first, algorithmic error. Well, if we feed these algorithms 
better data, you know, more accurate data, more equitable data, maybe we make the rules that guide them a little better, it, it's going to make them better, make better, they're gonna make better decisions. So for instance, if, uh, if we, we feed the facial analysis algorithm uh, more faces of darker skinned people, it's gonna close that error rate. Of course, that doesn't solve the problem of facial recognition cameras and, you know, and they're ubiquitous in our lives, but that's a whole different TED talk. The other problem is it's a little tougher to solve. When algorithms inherit existing human biases and build on these biases, that is a profound problem, one that will take great determination to solve. A root of algorithmic inequality is a chronic lack of diversity in technology fields. We need diverse voices building these platforms, training these platforms, and overseeing these platforms. And when I say diversity, I mean people of different ethnicities, different religious ideologies, uh, different socioeconomic statuses, different gender and sexual identities, people with physical and mental health differences. An algorithm shouldn't be built for one type of person. An algorithm should be built for all types of people. Many algorithms are designed to reinforce your worldview. They are designed to attract you, and they can become overzealous in their desire to please you. Dating app algorithms uh, can reinforce your feeling of what is beautiful and the type of person you, you should fall in love with. Social media algorithms are feeding you the content you're most likely to consume, even if that content is utterly false or reinforces your belief that you are more righteous than another person because you believe one way and he doesn't. Social or search engine algorithms are working to give you the answer to your query as quickly as possible, sometimes at the expense of equality. It will be up to you to understand when you see bias in these algorithms or when you are being manipulated by these algorithms, nobody is gonna do that for you. Not government oversight, public outcry, those who build these platforms, nor researchers. You have to do it for yourself. Algorithmic bias is a problem we've never faced as a species, although it mirrors an issue or a stain on humanity that's existed since pretty much the dawn of our species. At the end of the day, It'll be up to you to figure that out if you're being manipulated by these algorithms. In the world of Harry Potter, the Aperius curse lulls the victim into a false sense of tranquility. All feelings of responsibility have been removed and the victim is under total control of the caster. The Aperius curse can be broken, but it takes great determination. Similarly, it will take great determination to break the curse of algorithm, algorithmic bias. Thank you.